Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. Uh, the ladies' Bible study will meet it this Tuesday at seven p.m. at Sister Muff's house. Don't forget that. Second Peter three, and when you get that, into Second Timothy two. Second Peter chapter three and the book of Second Timothy chapter number two. Now actually Second Timothy comes uh, before. So just get those both there. And we'll read a verse of scripture here and I'm just gonna bring a few thoughts uh will give me and kind of repeat part of the message that we preached here a couple of years ago all the last couple of days this has been on my heart real heavy and I don't know I, I believe that there's somebody here this morning that definitely needs what I'm going to say today and um, the Lord knows always knows what he's doing and I'm trying to obey him and so I'm going to be bringing you a message this morning about people who are against their self and doing the best thing for themselves. And look at Second Peter 3, verse number 9, where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slack, but is long suffered, suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then in Second Timothy 2, in verse 24, the Bible says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but he but be gentle unto all men, out to teach and patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Isn't that a strange phrase? They oppose themselves? Why would a person want to be against themselves? Most people that I know want what's best for themselves. Matter of fact, that's about all they think about themselves. But according to the Bible, there are people who are working against themselves. Now, in the context there, you'll know that this verse of Scripture is saying, if you're not saved, listen to me, if you are not saved and you are rejecting the plan of God for your life, deliberately, on purpose, you are working against yourself. You're digging your, the pit for yourself to fall in. 
You're your biggest enemy. If you don't, if you're, if you're just saying, no, God, I'm going to do what I want to do and live like I want to live, and you ain't going to tell me, man, you're against yourself. You ought to think better of yourself than that and want what's best for yourself and being saved. And it's the title of the message this morning may strike you as kind of strange, and I guess it is unusual. The title of the message is Climbing to Hell. Climbing to Hell. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity to pray. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our help, our strength, and all the many, 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 many blessings of life, dear Lord, that you've given us. We thank you for the privilege of standing behind this pulpit and preaching the Word of God. Our Father, we know this morning the Word of God is not bound. I pray this morning for those that are here this morning whose souls are tangled up in sin or in form or shape. God, I pray that the Holy Ghost scissors may cut them loose today and set them free for Jesus' sake. I pray this morning the power of God will bring conviction on sin and, Lord, change lives and hearts and men and women, boys and girls today. Give us that special unction, anointing that we need to declare thy word. And may the truth hit home to the hearts of the people by the power of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to preach to you on the subject, Climbing to Hell. Now, the reason I said this title may strike you as strange today is this. Climbing is usually a word that you use, meaning that someone is making an effort to get somewhere. And hell is not a place that most people, get me down just a higher brother, that most people you'd think would try to get there. You'd think most people try not to go to hell. Now, the word climb means that I'm trying to get somewhere. Like, if I'm going to climb up into the choir, I'd step up here and step over here, and I'd go up there and I'd climb over that thing, and I'd go into the choir. I have to put forth an effort to get into the choir by climbing over that wall. Now, the message this morning is simply this. There are a lot of people by their actions and by their life and the way they conduct themselves, to, if, if you didn't know better, you'd think they're trying to get to hell. And brother, there's one thing about it, and let me tell you in no uncertain terms, if you keep trying the way some people's going, you're going to make it. Amen. You try long enough, you'll make it to hell. Amen. And it seems there's a lot of people have just determined in their mind and in their heart they're going to hell. They ain't going to change for God, the preacher, their husband, their wife, or nobody else, and almost working to get to hell. It seems like you say, oh, Brother Danny, I don't believe that. All right, just listen a few minutes. It seems like some people are bound and determined to go to hell no matter what it takes for them to get there. God loved us so much, He won't, doesn't want us to go to hell. And God puts obstacles in our path to keep us from going to hell. And the only way you can go to hell is climb over those obstacles that God puts in your path. All right, say that, uh, say that the choir up here is hell. And here I go, I'm on my life, and I'm 15 years old, and I'm 6 years old. Now, you know what God won't do? God won't make me make a decision. The Lord will not force you into changing. The Lord, and I want to tell you something, everybody here, God ain't going to force nothing down your throat. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go to church. They try to cram religion down your throat. God ain't going to force nothing down your throat, and we ain't either. We're just going to tell you what's going to happen to you if you don't accept it of your own free will. See, God will not make a person get saved to keep them out of hell. i tell you what God will do. God will throw obstacles in your path. See, He'll throw something in your path, and you run into it. Now, the only way I'm going to get to that choir is go around this obstacle. All right, I go over it. I climb over this obstacle, and then I run into another. Bam! And climb over it, and I finally make it. The only way you can get to hell is climb over the obstacles that God puts in front of you to keep you from going. The Lord is not going to snatch you up by the high of the head and drag you up here and make you get saved. He won't do it. The night I got saved, the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and knocked at my heart's door, and I responded to Him. 
That's as far as God will go with a man. God will not snatch you and drag. I've heard a lot of people give testimony and say the Lord hit me and drug me. No, He didn't. He did not hit you and drag you in. He'll convict you. He'll draw you. But brother, you decide whether you're going to come to Him or not. You accept Him or reject Him. And I'm telling you this morning, brother, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and don't repent of your sins, you're on your way to a burning hell. There's a lot of people say, well, I don't believe God's, uh, God's a good God. I don't believe He'd send people to hell. Hey, man, He's doing everything He can to keep you from going, but you're so stubborn and so, so mean that you keep going around all the obstacles that God puts in front of you and going on to hell anyway. I know that, I know that there's a lot of people planning on going to hell. We saw in front of the, the rock, uh, many of the rock albums the other night when He showed the slides, pictures of fire and people burning in the fire. And names on the front of the albums were "Burn in Hell." One of the songs, I believe, it's on a, it's on an ACDC album, or one of those. And the title song is, or not the title song, but one of the songs is "Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be." I don't know which group it was, but one of those groups. Other groups had songs like uh, 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 "Good Day in Hell" or something like that. Now these people have made up their mind they're going to hell. They've already decided it. They say, we're going to hell. And when we get to hell, we're going to drag out our guitars and stick out our tongues and party. And we're going to have a big time when we get to hell. Our generation is a weird generation, brother. We're, we're used to, used to little boys. I, I, I noticed something just over the Christmas season that really shocked me. Uh, you see bumper stickers. I, there's a song called Party Like It's 1999. Back in Florida, not long ago, uh, they were going to have a tidal wave. And they said people were warned. And a big tidal wave was going to come over and wipe thousands of people off the shore. Now, 50 years ago in America, you know what would have happened when they announced that over the radio? People had got down on their knees and started crying out to God. You know what happened recently? They got the booze and the drugs and the women and said, let's party it up tonight because we're going to be dead tomorrow. We're living in a generation. You hear me? We're living in a generation that has just already gave up on God. They say there's no hope. We don't even... Listen, brother. They say hell, heaven just a sin away. If, this, if that's heaven, I don't want to go. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to do right. We're living in a generation that says I want to sin. I want to live for the devil. I don't want God. I don't fear God. And they're on their way to hell unless they change and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, that kind of preaching is not popular. I know it. But in case you ain't heard lately, I'm running for a popularity contest. I'm not running for the best loved man in McDowell County. I lost that a long time ago. I'm, I'm down here to preach you the truth, and I'm going to come out one of these days at the judgment because I told you that hell is a bad place to be. I've seen a guy. You know, when we as little boys, when I was eight and seven, seven and eight years old, and boys, they mentioned dancing. And boy, if we seen a boy that danced, man, we think, well, what? He's queer or something? We think, what's up with that nut? We think, what's the matter with that poor little old sissified thing? He must wear panties. He don't. He don't wear. You know, he, what's the matter with that guy? We think he's crazy. And I remember, you remember, you remember when we was in high school and we had a school dance, and I even played in the band since we had. And the school dance, you couldn't get the boys to dance. The girls would go out there and dance with each other. Until a boy got to about the eighth or ninth grade, he wouldn't get out there. Oh, they'd sit up there on the bleachers and look tough, you know, and chew bubble gum and have their football jerseys on, be real sweaty, and have on dirty tennis shoes. Boy, ain't boys changed in the last few years. I never seen such a bunch of little sissified bunch of little boys they are now. That's pure. I seen one the other day going in the grocery store. And it was right about the day after Christmas, and they come down through here, and they had a jam box about as big as this thing right here. <laughs> well, it wasn't that big. You got to be graphic when you're preaching, though. But it was about it. We didn't like much being about this big. And boy, here they come in there, you know. And one of them had a wild-looking sweatsuit and a band around his head, and he's going. <laughs> Go ahead, and it, I said, "Ma'am, what's the matter with you? You got ants in your britches?" 
And he looked at me. That's what I said to him. I said, you got ants in your hands? And he looked at me. I mean, he's doing the office. i never seen him. He looked like he had worms. <laughs> hey, when I was a kid, you'd never see a, a boy acting like that. <laughs> really? You would. My soul. So, you know what kids' dream is nowadays? What'd you get for Christmas, kids? They say, oh, I got the best thing in the world. I got a jacket with 27 zippers and a jam box and a pair of parachute pants. What in the world? Somebody went with a coat with 27 zippers on it. Why would somebody want 27 zippers on a coat? Because it's cool. According to who? I don't think it's cool. See, they're brainwashed. They're pitiful. All they got to do is Michael Jackson do it. Everybody does it. Somebody does it. They're brainless and they don't realize. Now, it is it's just a fad. It's, they think it's the greatest thing that's ever come out. And it's just the world going through one fad after another. And the devil's keeping you up to occupy. Saying, this is new, this is new, this is new, this is new, that's new. Until he winds them all up in hell. I'm telling you this morning, brother, we're living in a weird generation. You see bumper stickers on the back of cars. That said, drive like hell, you'll get there. Speed on, brother. Hell ain't half full yet. And they laugh and make a joke out of hell. Many of you, you remember when you, before you were saved, you'd tell your friends to go to hell. You seen somebody that didn't like them, you saw them going to hell. You to go to hell. You go to hell. And people are always out there telling each other to go to hell. Hell is not a place to joke about. Hell is a place where there's fire and brimstone and burning and screaming and hollering and not a drop of water, and it ain't a joke. And five seconds after you get there, you'll change your tune and realize that it is not a joke. Here are some things that God wants us to notice. Now, I'm not going to mention all these tonight. I'm just going to mention, or this morning, I'm going to mention a few of them. But I tell you what, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, you will not have to go to hell, but have everlasting life. Now, here's what the Lord will do. The Lord puts obstacles in your way to keep you from going to hell. The only way that you can go to hell is go around or over those obstacles. That's why I titled the message, Climbing to Hell. Now, God puts mountains in front of you. The first mountain the Lord puts in front of you to keep you out of hell is the mountain of the church. The church is a mountain. Nobody in McDowell County can go to hell without crawling over the churches in this town. There are churches and steeples and crosses and services and revival meetings all over McDowell County. All of these, sure. You know why God saves us and leaves us here? As a blockade between men's soul and hell. This place that you're sitting in right now, this building. Now, I know, uh, uh, literally speaking, the building's not the church, but we refer to it as a church building. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, this building that you're sitting in right now is a block between men's soul and hell fire. That's why we ought to respect it. That's why we ought to put it first in our life. That's why we ought, it ought to mean something to it. This church is a blockade and a mountain that everybody in Mount County will have to get over if they go to hell. I've had people tell me over and over and over again. I've had people tell me they stood down there in the laundromat and they feel guilty when they look up here. They said they'd just look up here and see that sign. And they'd look and see the building. And they'd see people coming out of it. And something would say, you ought to be up there. You ought to be up there. And that person would stand there and make a decision. Am I going to go up there or am I going to stay down here? Do you know what? God put this church as a block between their soul and hellfire. I've had people tell me they drove up and down this road. And they said, Dad, you wouldn't believe it before I come here and got saved. Every time I drove up the road, I kind of got nervous when I looked up here and seen this old building. And they said, it was just, you know what this place is? To thousands of people right here in McDowell County, this church is a blockade putting their soul in hell. And brother, one of these days, if men go to hell and they die of their sins without God and go to hell and they're burning and screaming and hollering, you know what they'll say? They'll say, I climbed over every gospel church I ever seen in order to get here. I know the church was there. I know the sign said 10 o'clock. 
I know the service was going on Sunday night. I knew the doors was open. I knew the buses run. I knew the people were out so winning. I could have got saved, but I climbed over God's church and I went to hell. This church is a mountain between a man's soul and hell fire. And if you go to hell in here this morning, this church is between you and hell. The only way you can go to hell is climb over this church. I'm telling you this morning, not only that, but the amount of gospel sermons. Every sermon you've ever heard preached in your life is a blockade between your soul and hell. Did you know if you accept the Word of God, you can't go to hell? If you accept it and believe it, you go to heaven. But the only way you can go to hell is climb over the sermon that you've heard. A perfect illustration of this is the Pharisees in the Bible, where Jesus Christ preached to the Pharisees in the flesh. He said, you repent or you will perish. Now those guys were on their way to hell. Here's Jesus stepped in here and said, you repent or you'll perish. Now, the only way that they could go to hell was climb over that message Jesus gave them. That's the only way. They could not go to hell any other way. They said, I don't believe it, and climbed over that message, and that's why they're in hell this morning. They could have repented. That message could have detoured them off the road to hell, and they said, I accept it, Lord, and been in heaven this morning. But they rejected the Lord and, and, and climbed over the message, and I want to say this morning, we probably had many, many, many People stand right here where you're sitting this morning and hear the message and heard an opportunity to be saved and climbed over it, wouldn't accept it, that wouldn't just said no, walked out and said, I'll live my own life. That'll someday, if they're not already, wind up in hell. Hey, I'll tell you a shocking thought. There's probably been people sitting, you listen to me? There's probably been people sitting right where some of you are sitting this morning and heard the same preacher you're listening to right now that's in hell while I'm talking to you. They have the same chance you've got. You've got the same chance they had. You know what their problem was? They wouldn't believe. The Bible said some believe the things which are spoken and some believe not. And them, I've seen them stand up in churches and get a hold of the back of the seat and just stand there and just shake. I've seen almost, it looked like sometimes, I mean, their face would get red, they'd stare at the floor and they'd shake just like this. And they'd, and they'd stand there and they'd look up at me. And they'd look down at the floor. And they'd look over to friends. And they'd look up at me. And they'd look down at the floor. And look over to friends. Now right there is the most important minute in a man's life. There's no other minute more important than that in a man's life. That's when God the Holy Ghost is dealing with him. He'll either accept or reject the message. I've seen some come out of that seat, come up here and make it right. I've seen others turn and go out the door. And brother, they'll wind up in hell and climb over the gospel message they heard in order to get there. I've heard people say, well, I'm going to go home and think it over. And never dig back. I've heard them say, I'll be back next Sunday. And I ain't seen them since. I've heard them say, maybe later, Brother Danny. I don't know whatever happened to them. It's very, very, very dangerous for you to hear the preached Word of God and it convict you of your sin and you know you need to be saved and refuse to do anything about it. Dangerous. You could be making the worst mistake of all time and eternity because you climbed over the mountain of gospel sermons. Not only that, let me say right quickly, I'll skip some of these. The mountain of the Bible. Did you know the old Bible is a blockade between men's soul and hellfire? They sure are. The Word of God is a blockade. The old Bible is a blockade between men's soul and hellfire. You, if you had a dime for every old boy that had come home at night and looked over on the table and seen one of them things laying there and started crying, you'd be rich. If you had a dollar for every person that had come at night and looked at that Bible and then felt guilty of their sin and the Holy Ghost got a hold of them and said, you need to get saved, you'd be a millionaire, brother. That Bible is a blockade between men's soul and hell. There's just something different about that book that no other book in the world has got. You don't believe it? I heard about this preacher one time. He's preaching in a church, and he tried to get a bunch of people saved, and they wouldn't get saved. And he said, won't you come? And they wouldn't come. And he said, won't you come? And they wouldn't come. And he kept on and on and on. They wouldn't get saved. And he said, now, you ain't rejecting me. You're rejecting God. And he said, I tell you what I'm going to do. And he took his Bible back to the back and laid it down on the floor, right there on the floor. And he said, now, you're not rejecting my word, 
But he said, if you want to walk out of here this morning, you want to walk over that Bible, you go right ahead. But he said, when you do, you just remember, you are walking over the Word of God. And those grown men sit down in them pews. Man, they'd turn around there and they'd look at that Bible. They'd look back this way. They'd turn around there and look at that Bible. They couldn't stand the thought. They felt like if they stepped over that thing, they'd fall off into the fire immediately. And boy, they, some of them got saved. You know why? Step over this book. Now, I'm not going to lay my Bible. I don't reckon I am. I might. But I ain't planning on it. Laying my Bible back out the back door this morning. But what if I did? What if I took my Bible and laid it back out the door this morning? Would you just step over it and say, I don't, I just like spit on it. I ain't going to do what that Bible said. I ain't going to get saved. I ain't going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to live my life. Listen, when you get to hell, one of these days when you're in the fire and you're burning screaming, you'll say, I climbed over the mountain of the Bible in order to get to hell. Stepped over God's Word. And I'll tell you teenagers and moms and dads, it's not a cute thing to walk over top of what this book says. Amen. Man, you get yourself into a mess you'll never get out of. You're getting in such trouble with God, you'll never get out. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool who so despiseth the word shall be destroyed. And the old Bible is a blockade between men's soul and hell. And if you go to hell, you'll say, I climbed over the Bible in order to get here. Well, let me say right quickly also this morning, there's another mountain you've got to climb over in order to get to hell. And that's the mountain of your friends and loved ones' prayers. People who are praying for you. I'll bet you there's people in this room right now. I know they are. That somebody's praying for. And the only way you can go to hell, climb over the prayers of friends and loved ones. There's been a many of old boy that almost went to hell and was rescued at the last second because of mama's prayers. That held the wrath of God off of them long enough and prayed conviction down on them and got them saved. I believe that. But I believe the only way... Listen, listen. If you're a husband here this morning and you're not saved, you're a man or claim to be. If you're a man here this morning and you're not saved and you've got a wife that's praying for you, you're going to have a hard time going to hell. I might as well warn you. I'm going to warn you right now. You're in for a rough road, buddy boy. You, get, you better put your hard hat on, son, because God's going to almost beat your head in before it's over with. God's going to beat your head in. You say, he wouldn't do that. Oh, yeah? Just wait and see. You say, why? Because he loves you, and he's going to honor that wife's prayer. Son, I, I, I don't know. I'd hate to be a man with a woman praying for me. Or what a miserable life. What a miserable life. Can you imagine going to bed at night and hearing your wife in there in the other room saying, Oh, God! Oh, God! Man, what a way to live. I'd be scared to go out the door. I heard about this fella run away from home. And he said, Mom, I'm leaving, going out to Texas and live the big life and go to the bars and hit the honky-tonks. Do what I want to do. And Mama said, Son... She's an old woman crying when he left, but about to worry her to death. And she said, son, just remember now, before you leave, every night at 9 o'clock, I'm going to be down on my knees praying for you. Oh, mama, I don't want no religion. I want to live my own life. And he's gone. Weeks later, he's out in a bar out in Texas, and he's trying to get drunk, you know, and pour me another one, drinking it and putting that stuff away. And he said, oh, I've heard him something go, ding. Ding, ding. And he looked up and there was an old clock on the wall. Struck nine o'clock. Boy, when he said that happened, he, all he could see was his old mama down on her knees praying for him back home. He said he, he, he just seen his heart. And all he could think about, mama's praying for me. Mama's praying for me. Boy, it was one of them times when you try to get drunk and couldn't get drunk. You ever been under conviction so bad you couldn't get drunk? How many of you ever had that happen to you? Raise your hand. 
All right, there's one, two, three, four. You, man, the Lord dealing with you just right, you can't get drunk. I, he, he said, I can't stand. All I think about was Mama praying. Mama praying. Mama praying. The boy slammed that thing down and went out of that bar and went back home and got right with God. Mama's prayers was too high. He couldn't get over them, brother. There's a mountain, a blockade. He went to heaven in Mama's prayers. If you're here this morning, you've got unsaved loved ones, your friends, your husband, wife, daughter, brother, sister. Keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. It may seem like it's not doing any good, but they're having to do a lot of coming to get over your prayer. Guarantee it. I heard about... Matter of fact, I met this guy. We was down in Hickory giving out tracts on the street. We was down there that day, and I, I walked up to an old guy, and you could tell he was an alcoholic by looking at him. And as I offered him a tract, and he looked up at me, and his face was real red swelled up and wrinkled and you could tell by looking at him he was a drunk and he looked back at me and I said are you saved sir and I, if I remember correctly big old tears swelled up in his eyes and he just started talking real humble and I said what's the matter with you and I, I don't know what his name is I think it was Bill I'll call him Bill but Bill I said Bill what's the matter with you he said I'm not saved I said why ain't you saved Bill he said, well, I've got a lot of problems. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. My mother's a Christian. He said, if there ever was a Christian, my mother's one. She lives it. She prays. She reads the Bible. And he said, the strange thing happened to me one time. I said, what's that? He said, me and some boys took a car somewhere up north to Michigan or somewhere. And we was buying some cars. We was going to bring that new car back. And he said, when I got up there, all of us was drinking. And he said, me and my buddy was going to get in this car with these other fellas and ride back with them. And he said, I started to get in that car that day. And he said, there's a voice spoke to me just as plain as day and said, don't you get in that car. And he said, I backed up and it almost scared me. And he said, I wanted to get in. And something said, don't you get in that car. He said it was surreal, it scared me, and I backed off, and I said, boys, I don't believe I want to ride with you. That's all I want to make. Come on, get in here. No, I don't believe I want to ride with you. He went and got in the other car, and they took off. They spun out in that car that he didn't get in, hadn't gone a mile or two down the road, wrapped that thing around a tree, and killed every one of them instantly. And he said, you know, I've thought about that a lot of times. What was that that spoke to me? And I said, Bill, that's your mama's prayers. Your mama was probably at home down her knees praying that God wouldn't let you go to hell. And the only reason you ain't in hell right now is because your mama was a praying for you. I believe, brother, I, I believe it. If it's, it's hard to with somebody that's living on their knees for it. They have to climb. They have to work their way to get there. When they get to hell, can you imagine a man going to hell right here in McDowell County after hearing this sermon today? Can you imagine? There'll probably be, there'll probably be some of you people this morning walk right out of here and reject God and go on your way to hell. That's tragic, folks. That's terrible. I can't think of anything more terrible than to know the truth and see the light and the light shine on you. And you reject it. Well, the next thing I want to say is the mountain of the Holy Spirit. There's some, did you notice that there's somebody in here between, besides me and you? I've heard a lot of people say, I don't want to go back to that church. I felt uncomfortable. You know why, don't you? Because there's somebody in here besides me and you. See, if you just come in here and sit down and be living like the devil and enjoy everything... Man, we might as well shut the doors. We're out of business. We're out of business. When a sinner can be a, enjoy a service, I'm telling you the reason you feel uncomfortable this morning because God the Holy Ghost is puncturing your heart and saying you need to get right. You need to get right. You need to get right. And you'll never feel comfortable here until you make things right with God. It ain't, I ain't the one making you nervous. They blame it on me all the time. 
They say, he's brainwashing people. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to brainwash somebody if I tried. I've not got the slightest idea. The Lord can blood wash you. And wash your sins away in his blood. And then the last mountain. I skipped some of these things this morning and mentioned the last mountain. One more mountain you're going to have to go over to go to hell. See, you can say, I ain't going to listen to the church. I ain't going to listen to the preacher. I'm going to walk over the Bible. I ain't going to listen to the Holy Ghost. I ain't going to pay no attention to my friends and loved ones' prayers. I ain't going to listen to the, to, the, to the voice of the Lord. You've got to walk past one last mountain before you die and go to hell. And when you get to hell, this will bother you bad. And it's a mountain, what the Bible calls Mount Calvary. On a hill, far away, stood an old rugged cross. And right before a man dies, he has to walk over Mount Calvary, see a bleeding, dying Savior on that cross, and look up at him and say, Appreciate it just the same, Jesus, but I'll make it my way. And walk right by the cross of the Lord Jesus. That's it. That's it. It's a drop-off past Calvary, brother. You walk past Calvary, you're doomed. You're doomed! For neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For whosoever shall call the name of the Lord, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. If you make up your mind and say, I know Jesus died on the cross for me, but who cares? I'm going to live it my way. I'm good enough as my own. There's no hope for you. Amen. No hope. No, no hope. No hope. You say, well, I'm a Baptist. No hope. Amen. You say, I'm a good person. I pay my bills. There's no hope for you if you walk past Jesus Christ on Calvary. He shed His blood for the sins of the world. That's a mountain. Mount Calvary, the Shavu Skull, Golgotha, where He shed His blood and gave His life. And if you go to hell, it'll ring in your ears throughout eternity. My boy saying, Don't do it, friend! Don't do it! Don't do it! Don't do it! He'll say, I went over and climbed over Mount Calvary in order to get to hell. Some of you look like you're scared. And you ought to be. You ought to be about ten times more than you are. If I thought there was a chance, knowing what I know about hell now, if I thought there was a chance that my feet would go out from under me and the, the ground open up and me go down into hell, but I'd be doing something about it. You say, well, I don't want to quit my sins. Hey, there ain't no sin worth going to hell over. The rich man, when he got to hell, here he's on earth, he was rich. He was clothed in the best clothes. Had plenty of money. Fine house. He even had anything somebody could want. Buddy, when he got to hell, he cried like a beggar for one drop of water on his tongue. And he said, send somebody to get him out. And he remembered. He remembered Lazarus laying there as a witness. He remembered hearing about the resurrected Son of God, but he climbed over every one of those things and went to hell. God help you not to do it. That's about it.